Hi and welcome to this Junior Cycle Higher Level Maths video where we're looking at perimeter, area, volume and also surface area in relation to triangles and the shapes related to triangles. So as part of this video we're going to look at rectangles, squares, triangles, parallelograms. We're then going to look at the 3D shapes of rectangular solids um, and also triangular prisms. So let's first look at rectangles and squares. The two main measurements we're going to look at here are perimeter and area. So the perimeter is the outside of the shape. So we're going to add all of the sides together. And area is the amount of space inside the shape. So to calculate this, we multiply length by width. That's for a rectangle. With a square, the length and width will be the same size, but this formula is still the same. So let's jump straight into an example. So example one, let's look at the area and perimeter of rectangles and squares. So in this example, we have a rectangle and it's asking us to find first the area and then the perimeter of this shape. So let's look at the area first. So to calculate the area, we're going to multiply my length by width. The length is 14 and the width is 9. So multiplying that together, we get 126. Our units now, because we're multiplying centimetres by centimetres, area is centimetres squared. The second part then is perimeter. Now you have a few different ways that we can work this out. You can add 9 and 14 and then add another 9 and another 14. That is a very simple way to do it. Another thing you can do is you can add your 9 and 14 together and then double your answer. So I can do it like this. Or you could double 9, double 14 and then add your answer. No matter what way you do that, you should get the same answer. So if we add 9 and 14, we get 23. And then doubling the answer, we get 46. In this case, we are adding centimetres, centimetres, centimetres and centimetres. So our answer is going to be simply centimetres. So area is really a two dimensional measure and perimeter is a one dimensional um, measure. So that idea of one dimensional, two dimensional, it can really help us when we look at our unit. So that two dimensional area is centimetres squared. Notice that power two. And our one dimensional uh, perimeter is just centimetres to the power of one, but we don't write that power of one. So it's simply centimetres. So now let's work backwards. So we have two different examples here within example two. The first one is a rectangle that has 12 centimetres and an unknown side. And we know that the area is 84 centimetres squared. The reason I know its area is the units, that centimetre squared and the fact that it's written in the inside. So let's call this missing side X. So if I have 12 and I multiply it by that missing side X, we get 84. So I have 12X equals 84. So to work backwards there, to get X on its own, we divide both sides by that coefficient, which is, sorry, I have 18 here, it should be 84. So we're dividing it by that coefficient, which is 12. So we get X equals, and that's seven centimetres. Now you might look at that and go, oh, but I could have easily done that by just saying, you know, 84 divided by 12. And that's exactly what we did. I've just laid it out in a more of an algebraic way. It's a good idea to get used to using algebra in cases where it's easier, like here. So then when we get onto harder questions that require us to use algebra, that you're more familiar with it. But it doesn't have to be laid out like this if you wanted to go straight to 84 divided by 12. Like I said, it's the same sum we did and that gives me seven centimetres. That's absolutely perfect. Now, the length of the missing side of the square, this is a little bit trickier. And the reason is that all the sides are the same length. So let's call this one Y and this one Y. So when we would work with the square, sometimes I see students dividing it by two because both sides are the same. But just be very careful. Again, I'm going to use my algebra. I'm going to multiply my y by my y, and that will give me 625. y by y is actually y squared. So by writing it out like this, it should be a little bit easier to see that actually dividing by two is not correct. 
If I have a y squared and I want to get rid of the squared, what I'm doing is I'm putting a square root on both sides. So I'm square rooting both sides of my equation, which will leave me with y equals. And if we do the square root of 625, we get 25. So my answer is 25 centimetres is the length of that square. So just remember that power 2, that squared, is called that because it's the area of a square. So just be very mindful of the backward step there being a square root. I don't know if this is as obvious to do if we weren't showing it with our algebra, but you can, of course, go straight to square root of 625 equals 25 centimetres. So now let's talk about triangles. So we have a few triangle formula that are on page nine of the log tables, and I'm going to focus on this one here. So the area is equal to half A by H. And if we take a look at the diagram that accompanies this formula, A is what I would call the base. And H is this height here. Now, this height is a very special height because it is perpendicular. And you can kind of see this right angle there. I've just covered it. So I probably should uncover it because it's probably easier to see when it's not highlighted. So we have that square little square shape which tells us it's a right angle which means it's the perpendicular height so the formula is half the base by the perpendicular height so let's go into an example of working with the area of these triangles so the area of the triangle is half my base which in this case is 14 by the perpendicular height which is 8. Now sometimes students try to do this in their head and they say half of 14 which is 7 so I'm multiplying 7 by 8 and that's absolutely perfect but here we have three numbers and we're multiplying them together and it doesn't matter what order you multiply them in so you may find it easier to have the height or you may find it easier to have the answer. So here we have half by 14 by 8. Like I said, you can put that all into the calculator or you can have 14, which gives me 7. 7 by 8 gives me 56. And again, I'm area, so I'm centimetres squared. The first triangle we have here, this green one, is an acute triangle. And an acute triangle is called that because all of the angles in it are acute angle. So acute angle is an angle less than 90 degrees. The second triangle we have, which is here in yellow, is an obtuse triangle. And it's called an obtuse triangle because one of the angles, which is this one here, is obtuse. Now the other two are still acute because all the angles in a triangle have to add up to 90. But when we start working with obtuse triangles, we can get a little bit confused, especially when we talk about the area. You can notice here that the perpendicular height this for this triangle is given outside of the triangle itself. You see this dotted line here that's marked eight. And I suppose it doesn't matter where the height is given. All that it matters is we calculate or we have that height of that triangle. So this actually is a much more simple question than sometimes students realize. So this is a half. The base is this bottom piece here and it's only this portion. OK, we're not extending it because the triangle isn't extended. So it's half of 15 by that perpendicular height, which is given as 8. Here's a great example to say that actually it might be easier to do a half of 8 rather than a half of 15, because 15 is obviously an odd number. So a half of 8 is 4 and 4 times 15 is 60. So my answer here is 60 centimetres squared. Don't overcomplicate these obtuse triangles. It's still a half the base by the perpendicular height. Any side can be the base. So in both of these examples, the base was written at the bottom, but it doesn't have to be. Once we turn the triangle, and remember you can rotate the triangle whatever way you want, and we have one side and then a height that is perpendicular to that side, we can use those two measurements for our area calculation. So now let's talk about working backwards. So I have another obtuse triangle here and they have the base labeled X, but they have given us the area. So the area, remember, is a half. I like to say by base, by perpendicular height. Uh, but the formula in our log tables is a half a H where A is the base and H is the perpendicular height. So filling in what we know, the area is 112. 
and that's a half times that a or base which is x times the perpendicular height which is 16. Again, I'm going to look at this right hand side and I have three things multiplied together, a half by x by 16. It's going to be easier for me to work a half of 16 first because 16 is a number and an even number, which makes it easier to work with. So I get 112 is equal to half times 16, which is 8x. Now, I like to work with my letters on the left, so I'm going to flip this equation. So I'm going to say, well, 8x is equal to 112. And then to finish that off, I'm dividing both sides by the coefficient of x, which is my 8. So I'm doing 112 divided by 8. And then I get x is equal to 14, and that's in centimetres as well. Be careful, make sure that you're including your units each time. So when you want to work backwards, again, you can kind of do this in your head if you wanted to. You could do half times x times 16. So you could do that as 8 times some number gives me 112. So my answer is going to be 112 divided by 8. But again, algebra, it gives us a much stronger basis to see what's going on. And our workings are really, really good in that case. So let's look at some triangles where we have some missing information. And in this case, we're going to be using Pythagoras to find this missing information. So I have two questions here. Um, I have a triangle and it wants us first to find the area and then the perimeter. So let's look at the area first. So my area is a half times. Now I have the full base here, so part of it is 3 and part of it is 7, so this is 10 millimetres. So I have a half times 10 times 6. Uh, just be aware that it is in millimetres, so I have 30 millimetres squared. So quite straightforward. Part 2 then for the perimeter, this is a little bit trickier. So the perimeter is the outside of the triangle, so I want to add this to this to this side and that base is all I know. So I have 10 plus two sides that I don't actually know. So I have the perimeter is equal to 10 plus some number plus some number and I don't know what they are. So I'm going to call this one x and I'm going to call this one y. So that's a little bit easier than just using those boxes. And how are we going to work out these x's and y's? Well, that's six millimetres. That height is a perpendicular height. So what we actually have are two different right angle triangles. So let me pull out the first one here. So in this one, I have a three millimetre side, x and six. So I'm actually going to use Pythagoras to find my missing side. When we use Pythagoras, the hypotenuse, which is the longest side or the side opposite the right angle, that's always labelled C. And then the other two are labelled A and B. So I get C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. So I get X squared is equal to 3 squared plus 6 squared. So X squared is equal to 9 plus 36. So X squared is equal to 45. We square root both of these. And we get X is equal to the square root of 45, which I'm going to put into my calculator to simplify. And that's going to give me 3 root 5. And I'm going to leave it like that. Um, you can change it to a decimal, but thirds are that little bit more accurate. So I'm going to leave it in third form. I'm now going to go back and look at the second right angle triangle that we had in the question. Here we have a 6, a 7 and y. Again, I'm going to use my Pythagoras. C has to be the hypotenuse, but A and B, it doesn't matter. So C squared equals A squared plus B squared. So my C is Y squared is equal to 6 squared plus 7 squared. So Y squared is equal to 36 plus 49. So I get Y squared is equal to 85. We're going to square root both sides. And we'll just double check. Do we get anything simpler? And we don't. So it's 85. So going back up here to the perimeter. I'm just going to block this off. So they were our workings. We have 10 plus 3 root 5 plus root 85. And we can put that into the calculator. 10 plus 3 root 5 
plus root 85. And that's going to give us an answer. So we get 25. I'm going to do it to one decimal place. And that's going to be in, oh, not centimetres, apologies, millimetres. So not squared because we're in perimeter. So 25.9 millimetres. So anytime we have a perpendicular height, perpendicular, remember, it means meeting at right angles. We effectively create right angle triangles. And anytime we have right angle triangles, we will be able to use Pythagoras. So if you feel there's something missing in triangles, think, could I use some trigonometry or Pythagoras to help me out? So let's look at another example of where we can use Pythagoras to find missing information. So it asks us to work out the area of this triangle and we can see by the measurements that this is actually an isosceles triangle, which means two sides are the same. This kind of question would only work if we have an equilateral or an isosceles triangle, because if we had a scalene, when I draw in this perpendicular height, we wouldn't know how it split the base. But because it's isosceles, and this also works for an equilateral, the base is bisected, which means cut in half, by that perpendicular line. So if you think back to your constructions, that line perpendicularly bisects the base, which means I have two right angle triangles. They are congruent, which means they are identical. Um, they both have a base of five. Uh, they have a slant height of eight, but we don't know that perpendicular height. But I can work it out. So let's pull out a little right angle triangle. It doesn't matter which one we work with. Like I said, they are congruent. So I have H here, which I'm trying to work out, eight, and the base is five. So my Pythagoras, C is always my hypotenuse. A, B, it doesn't matter. So C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. So I get eight squared is equal to H squared plus five squared. So I get 64 is equal to H squared plus 25. I'm gonna take away a 25 from both sides. I'm using vertical balancing here, but you don't have to. So I get, what do we get here? 39 is equal to H squared. So I'm gonna square root both sides. And I end up with H is equal to square root of 39. You can put that into your calculator to see does it simplify, uh, but it doesn't. It stays like that. So we end up with my root 39 here. We were asked for the area. So we have a half times the base. Now it's the whole triangle. So my base of the whole triangle is 10 by perpendicular height, which is root 39. And um, I'm leaving it in square root form. Um, I will usually do that anyway, but look at the way they've asked us to give the answer. It's going to have a five square root in some number. So we have to have that square root in our answer. So half times 10 is five. Five times root 39. You can put that into your calculator. But that is as simple as it becomes. And that is exactly the form that they wanted. Five, a square root, and then a natural number underneath the square root. Natural number, remember, is a positive whole number, which 39 is. So anytime you have a triangle that's missing information, think, could I use Pythagoras? It's really linking back to that square um, this, sorry, it's really linking back to that right angle that's coming from that perpendicular height. So here's another example of not Pythagoras being used, but trigonometry. So use trigonometry to find the length of the side marked X centimetres. Give your answer correct to two decimal places. Now, I have an isosceles triangle here. I know that because the two bottom angles are 70 degrees. So I actually know that this is X. What I know then is if I drop my perpendicular height, I create my right angle. Now they've told me to use trigonometry. So I'm going to pull out one of my triangles. And again, it doesn't matter which, because the way I've split this, I have created two congruent or identical triangles. Let me make this a little bit bigger. <laughs> So I can work with it. So there's my 70 
Uh, here's my x. I've split the bottom, so that's going to be 3.5 there. So give me that hint, trigonometry. There's my right angle. Because I'm using trigonometry, that's my sine, cos, tan. I'm going to label it for sine, cos, and tan. So I have opposite the angle. I have my hypotenuse, and I have my adjacent. Now, the opposite has no number there, so I'm not going to be using that. So I'm going to use Sakatoa to try help me figure out which of my trigonometric ratios I want to use. And because I've crossed out opposite, I'm going to get rid of anything that has opposite, which leaves me with cos. So the formula for cos is cos of the angle is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. So let's fill in what we know. We have the cos of the angle, which is 70 degrees, is equal to adjacent, which is 3.5 over x. Now, you can leave the cos of 70 as it is, um, or if you prefer, we can just change that to a number. So going to our calculators, making sure that your calculator is set up properly, you can put in cos of 70 degrees. It has asked me for my final answer to two decimal places, so I need to leave myself a few extra places um, just for multiplying. We don't want to lose anything. So I get 0 0.342 and then another 0. So I'm going to leave it to three decimal places, 3.5 over x. Now, to get rid of a fraction, I multiply by the denominator. So my denominator here is an x. And I do that to both sides because it's an equation and I want to keep my balance. The x on the top and the x on the bottom, they cancel out. But really what's happening is they divide into each other to give me 1. So my next line looks like 0.342x is equal to 3.5. Now, to get x on its own, we're going to divide by the coefficient. We may not be used to decimal coefficients, but they're still the coefficient. So I'm dividing by that number in front of x. And when I do that, I have 3.5 divided by 0 0.342. And to two decimal places, I get 10.233. So I get 10.3, and that's centimetres. So that's my value of x. So again, seeing how the triangle can be split into right angle triangles and trigonometry can be used to find missing sides. So now let's talk about parallelograms. Parallelograms are a quadrilateral shape, so they have four sides. Um, and opposite sides are parallel, opposite sides are equal length, and opposite angles are equal. So they could be a question that mixes the area piece, which we're going to look at now, with some geometry. So the most important thing to note, first of all, is a parallelogram can be split into two congruent or equal triangles. So I've outlined one there in blue. So if we first of all take the area of a triangle, which is a half by base by perpendicular height, and we say, well, actually, we have two of them. So we multiply that formula by two. Two times a half is one. So two times a half times base times perpendicular height actually simplifies down to base by perpendicular height. And that is the formula for area of a parallelogram. It's on page eight of our log table. So here it is. You can see that it is A times H, where A is the base and H is, again, that perpendicular height. So let's get the area and perimeter of this parallelogram here. Let's start with area. So the area is going to be the base by that perpendicular height. So A is equal to. Now, we have more sides to work with here in a parallelogram. So it's a bit easier to get confused. So just be careful. You want to find a side, any side can be the base, but you want to find the side where the height is drawn perpendicular to it. So they, the two sides I've highlighted in yellow, they're going to work as my base and then the perpendicular height. So the area is going to be my base, 14, by perpendicular height, which is 7. There's no half here because we're dealing with a parallelogram. So don't confuse your formulas. And that gives me 98 centimetres squared. My parallelogram, the perimeter of it, is going to be very similar to when we were talking about rectangles and squares. So a few different ways you can do it. 
Opposite sides are equal, so this is 9 centimetres and this is 14 centimetres. So you can add all those numbers together or you can add 9, 14 and then double your answer. So that's kind of probably my preferred way of doing it. You can also double 9 and double 14 and then add them together. So 9 and 14 is 23 and then when I double that I get 46. My perimeter, remember I'm just adding centimetres, so it's going to be measured in centimetres. So now let's move on to three dimensional shapes. So we're going to talk about prisms. So a prism is a solid object that has two identical ends. And think of your Toblerone box there. Um, the cross section is the same all along its length. So what we mean by cross section is, imagine you take that Toblerone box and imagine you slice it. And um, you would slice triangles the whole lengthways. That's called the cross section. You can see in our second picture there, you could slice B's, you'd have to slice vertically, so down. And then the last one is kind of like a Toblerone box on its side or on its face. Um, and you could slice that horizontally to make triangles. So the shape of the end gives the prism name. So we're going to focus on triangular prisms. So prisms that have a triangular face at the end. So is the cylinder a prism or not a prism? Now, um, officially it is not a prism um, because a prism has to be a polyhedron, which basically means the sides have to be flat. And because a cylinder has curved sides, technically it doesn't fall under the correct definition of a prism. However, it does act like a prism. So many books keep it as a prism and we'll say that it's a prism. So I don't want to contradict any of your books out there. Um, why I'm including and why I'm even mentioning it is because the formula for a cylinder, it follows the same format as a prism. Now we're not going to look at cylinders in this video. Um, there is a second video that works with circles and includes cylinder and I've linked that in the description below. Um, but just to be aware that it really, that formula, and it's in the log tables for the cylinder, it is a version of the prism formula. So we're going to talk about prisms um, in the true sense in this video and there are two main types. So there's irregular and irregular prisms. So basically, a regular prism is something that has a shape that we can talk about. Um, and then an irregular is one where the shape is a compound shape. So where there's lots of shapes kind of stuck together or you can split it into other shapes. So think of you might have a rectangle with a semicircle stuck on it. Um, so we're going to focus on a regular prism, so a triangular based prism. That's what our focus is for this video. So prisms, they are actually in the log tables and they're here as on page 11 as V is equal to BH. Now it says this is a solid of uniform cross section or in other words a prism and it takes B as the area of the base. So area of the cross section really. So the slice. So if I did lots of slices and they're all the same, what was that slice? So you get an area of that and then you multiply it by H. Maybe a little hard to see, so most students actually kind of do this automatically. This is what it looks like for our triangular based prism. So it's the area of the base. So that's the one, the cross section, where it's on both ends, multiplied by the length of it. So the base area by length. And that's what we're going to work at. Uh, these questions can be really good higher level questions because a lot of what we've already done for the area of the triangle can be included when we talk about these triangular based prisms. So let's look at a volume of a triangular base prism and it just asks us to find the area of this prism. Now this one's very easy because the area is given to us by 90 uh, as 90 centimetres squared. So the volume is going to be that area. So they've given that shape there. That triangular piece is 90 centimetres squared and we're going to multiply that by 13. So 90 multiplied by 13, that gives me 1170. And that is centimetres cubed. Be very, very careful not to start converting your answers because conversion between centimetres and metres, which is 100 centimetres equal one metre, that does not stay the same when we talk about centimetres squared and centimetres cubed. So if you want to convert, convert to the start of your question. But my advice will be to leave it alone. Don't get into bad habits of trying to change these centimetres cubed 
back because actually if you wanted to change this i think it's 0 0.00117 meters cube so it's really really tiny so example 10 let's look at the, the volume of this triangular prism in this case they didn't give us the area so i'm going to work the area piece first so my area is half my base i'm looking at this triangle here so my base is 12 by my perpendicular height, which is 8. So you can do whatever way you want. Um, a half times 12 is 6. 6 times 8, we get 48 centimetres squared. My volume is then that area piece, 48, multiplied by the length. So 48 multiplied by 20. What's that? 960 centimetres cubed so quite straightforward Um, it's not a bad formula you work out the area of the face first and then you multiply it by the length so how long or how much of that face could you cut example 11 here we have a triangular prism but we haven't been given the information that we need to find the area of the face so in order to find this area, let me outline my face here. So we want to find the area of this triangle first. But to do that, we would need a perpendicular height, which we don't have. Now this, if you've watched the full video, this question might be a little bit familiar because actually what we did um, back in example six was we actually worked with that triangle. So I've popped it in here. Um, so you can see we have that triangle there on an end. So this could be a nice carry on question. So they might start with this question. So they might start with a triangle, find the area, and then a follow on might be now get the volume. So our area here, we can see worked out as 5 root 39. Just a recap, if you didn't watch it, maybe go back and watch example 6. Uh, we dropped that perpendicular line because it was isosceles and um, the perpendicular line bisected the base, which meant we were able to work with the right angle triangle. We worked with Pythagoras to figure out what the height was. The height worked out as root 39 and we got our area then half the base by that perpendicular height. Uh, there's another little trick to this question and that is the fact that it is one meter here and we can't work with meters because everything else if you notice is in centimeters so i'm going to change that to 100 centimeters so to get my volume i'm going to take my area which is 5 root 39 we worked that out in example 6 and i'm going to multiply that by 100 and that will work out as 500 root 39 if you want to leave that in third form the question will hopefully be a bit clear about whether you need it in third form or decimal and if you want to change it to a decimal it gives me 3,122.49 so I'm going to leave it here and then that centimeters cubed so just to be aware everything we've done with the area of triangles can be introduced here to volume so our final piece of this video is starting to look at the net and surface area of triangular prisms so a net is where you open the 3d shape and make it flat and two-dimensional so i've given you an example here you can see that a triangular prism has three rectangular sides and then two triangles on each end the two triangles will always be identical that is the definition of a prism that the cross section is and um, the same the whole way through it is identical so the ends must be identical so we're going to use this to try work out the surface area in our final example so this is example 12 so it asks us for the surface area of this triangular prism so they might ask you to do the net as well. I've put the net in here. Uh, for the surface area, we really want to work out the area of each piece. So let's work this through. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. So I'm going to put on my length. So we're going to say this is 11 millimetres. So this is 19 millimetres. This is 19 millimetres. These are all equal, 19 millimetres. Uh, 19 millimetres, and this is nine millimetres. So my triangle here, I'm gonna do the, the area of that triangle. So it's half the base. Um, so I'm looking at this piece here. Oh, that wasn't great to outline it. Let me use my highlighter. So I'm gonna work this piece here. So it's half the base. 
which is 12 by the perpendicular height, which is 7, which is 6, 7. So we have 42 millimeters squared comes in here, 42 millimeters squared on this side as well, because they're identical. Um, my base, which I never filled in, was 12 millimeters. So let me just highlight so we can see our totals, our areas. And now I'm going to work out just each of the areas of the rectangles. The first one is 19 by 11, so I get 209 millimeters squared. And then our middle triangle, our middle rectangle is 12 by 19, so that's 2, 2. 228, sorry, 228 millimeters squared. And our last one is 9 by 19, and that's one. Oh, I'll highlight it first. That'll make it a bit easier. So I get 9 by 19, which is 171 millimeters squared. And then my surface area is going to be adding all of those together. So I add 209, 228, 171 plus 42 plus 42 and we get 692 millimeters squared as our surface area for that triangular prism. Now you don't have to work with um, a net. Why I like working with the net is it means you're not going to forget the two sides that we're missing. So you can see the back triangle, but that's the same as the front. You, but you can't see the base either. So it can be easy to kind of forget about that base. So drawing out a net can be useful, even if it's only just a small or a sketch of a net. But you could also be asked to draw one and to draw one accurately. So if you were asked to draw one accurately, um, we'd have to start looking at our construction for drawing the triangular piece. So to remember that, um, sketch is fine. It's kind of a rough drawing. It doesn't have to be 100% accurate. It's usually just for our own benefit. But if it says to um, draw accurately or to construct, you need to start thinking about, well, how do I construct a triangle where I know the three sides? And the answer is you're using your constructions that you've already learned and you're using your compass to help you do this.